Today I'm here and I'm sitting with one of the sustainability and climate champions. Pleasure to be with you. Kindly introduce yourself. Tell us your name and tell us about your passion that brought this FSD Africa up. Well, thank you. So my name is Mark Napier. I have um, a background in investment banking. Um, but for most of my recent career, I've been in development finance, trying to um, cause financial systems to change for the benefit primarily of poorer people. And recently, um, the focus has been turning a lot towards sustainable finance, <laughs> and particularly uh, green finance um, especially. And we've been investing a lot in that area over the last few years. So it's been quite a journey from financial inclusion through capital market development, and now into green finance, but it's been a very worthwhile journey. So what do you do? Well, we spend a lot of time with policymakers and regulators. So the, the main focus of the program is to create an ecosystem that allows investment to flow. Um, and so we do a lot of work around policy and regulation, building the trust uh, of investors in financial markets. Um, we build capacity um, within regulators and within financial institutions. Um, and we also use our capital to create transactions and invest in businesses that cause markets to be more competitive and more innovative and basically more accessible to a much broader group of the population. You've been here for nine years, right? Correct. How has it been, being at the helm of FSD Africa? Well, it's been a long journey, but I think we've had a lot of impact. Um, over the years, we've brought financial services to more than five million individuals, more than three and a half million small businesses. We've crowded in, we've mobilized more than one and a half billion dollars of investment um, through the investing activities that we've done. So I think we can be proud of the impact that we've achieved, but I think more important, I think we've demonstrated that there is a need for a kind of market catalyst in the market, that's what we do, to try and drive change in the market. We feel that there is a useful purpose for the work that we do, and, and there uh, seems to be no end of opportunity, really, for the kind of support that we can provide. You work with uh, so many stakeholders within the industry, or governments, private equity funds, project managers. What are some of these uh, one or two projects you have that have impacted positively to the African society? So our philosophy is very much that whether you're talking about finance for the poor or financial, um, or, 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 or financial inclusion, um, the two are linked. So, so whether you're talking about capital market development or, or inclusive financial products, they're, they're, they're very closely linked and they're very interdependent. Um, and so that's why we do a very wide range of projects. So on the one hand, um, we've been, uh, for example, supporting um, the introduction of mobile banking-based uh, basic banking products for um, for street traders in Nigeria, for example. Um, so that's building the capacity of a local bank there to be able to roll out these kinds of product, products. Um, and also uh, working in Mathari here, working with youth entrepreneurs, um, giving them cash transfers to see whether that would encourage them to do their businesses better. But at the other end of the spectrum, um, we also work with the capital market regulators, building the capacity of the regulators, making it easier for them to do their work, um, and, and, and supporting transactions, particularly increasingly now in the green space. Do you think the African countries are uh, doing enough to get themselves into that space? Into the green finance yes, space? Yes, yes. So we have been active in building green bond markets for the last four or five years. And so when we started that, so this is 2017, mm -hmm. in Kenya and then in Nigeria, um, sort of putting in place investment guidelines and other regulations that allow for green bonds to, to take root. 
that was quite pioneering. Um, and in truth, I would say that progress has been quite limited. So Nigeria has done a sovereign green bond. Mm -hmm. Kenya, we're still waiting for Kenya's sovereign <laughs> green bond. Right, some the way. <laughs> which we are assured is on its way and, and long, uh, you know, we're long awaited, let me tell you. But, uh, and there's still only been one corporate green bond in Kenya. So, um, so it, is, it does take a long time. But I think uh, what we're also seeing now is that there is increasing interest on the part of the regulators to um, introduce um, enabling regulation for green finance. There's interest on the part of the stock exchanges also to deliver um, products that institutions can invest in, institutions and retail investors can invest in that are green as well. Because there is the beginning of, grow of growing interest, I think, in green finance. So, so I, I would say Africa is on the move on green finance, but it's, uh, we're at quite an early stage and I think there's quite a long road that we need to travel. So is this the place where now the corporate institutions and individual market players come in to fix this deficit? Well, you need champions in any market, right? You, yeah. you really need champions. Um, and the champions, they don't need to be people like us. They can be champions within the regulators or the, within, the, within the policy makers. They can be financial institutions as well. There are some very progressive financial institutions that, that really believe that this is the future and that they need to invest in um, understanding how to develop green products um, that really appeal to a much broader group of, uh, particularly the younger population that are very interested in green products because it's their future, right? Um, and so I think, um, I think a lot of educated younger people realize that this continent is, is the most vulnerable continent to, to climate change. Um, and they would like to support, in whatever small way that they can, they would like to support um, the way the economy functions in order that um, the place that they grow up in is going to be safe and clean. And secure, and, and 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 so that's why I think it's good for insurance companies to begin that process of trying to understand where this emerging market is coming from and what they would really like to invest in. You just say two or three African countries are trying a little bit to move with the narrative of green finance. Why is it that? Uh, there is no resources or the capacities, or is it uh, the need to just not want to conform? No, I, I, the ones who get it, uh -huh. the countries who get it, are the ones who are realizing that their development trajectory needs to be funded, and they need to explore different opportunities for getting money in to be able to fund their development. And that's really the critical thing. So, so no country would go for the green agenda if it didn't also deliver on their development needs, right? And so what, what we've been saying is that um, you need to mainstream green into your development. And when you do that, you can then start to appeal to a much broader group of international investors who want actively to invest in green products. And so you as a country can issue a green bond, get that funded by very large financial institutions, um, and you can then uh, find ways to fund your, your continuing development. So what we're talking about is a development story powered by climate. It's not primarily a climate story, and that's a really critical point to, mm. to note. Um, and I just simply think it's a process of um, building awareness on the part of those other African countries that haven't quite worked that out yet, but they will get there. Um, and so that's part of what we're in business to do. So you're very optimistic about it? I am very optimistic because I think there's a, a real um, opportunity. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not, 
I think often, oftentimes we think about the need to fund um, projects to protect ourselves against climate change, and there's a huge, a huge investment requirement. We're not seeing the investment opportunity, and that's, that's we need to invert the discussion a little bit. Let me let me tell you a, a story. We we have recently published um, some research looking at the economic value of investing in green. Um, sustainable green urban development, okay? Um, and the numbers are staggering um, in terms of the incremental investment that you need to put in and the net present value of that return that you then get back. And so in Kenya, for the four, for the four cities that we looked at, Nairobi, Mombasa, Nakuru, um, and Kisumu, the incremental investment that would be required by 2050 to, uh, to send those cities on a green development pathway is $27 billion. That's a big number. Mm -hmm. But you get back from that $54 billion in value. So why, economically, would you not take that route? Why would uh, individual governments, let's say even the county governments, not appreciate the value? Many, many reasons why. And one of them is, is that particularly counties or cities, they don't have the powers to be able to do certain things, to make certain decisions. And so there is a discussion about, are there ways to, uh, for national governments to delegate some of those decision-making and finance-raising powers to, to the local level? Um, because that might make things more efficient. But I think a lot of the problem is to do with coordination. You know, organizing, um, a different way for a city to develop requires all sorts of vested interests to be confronted, rules to be passed, creative financing structures to be raised. And that just requires a lot of effort. And um, I think sometimes national governments don't have the capacity and um, or they don't have the political will, unfortunately. So what do you do in your free time? <laughs> How many hours do you clock, baby? I Oh, I, <laughs> you've talked to my <laughs> colleagues. Uh, they, they get emails at very strange hours. No, I, have a, I love my work and, mm -hmm. I, and I love the program that I run. And um, I think we're doing an important job. Um, and it's incredibly interesting. Um, and so it's a real privilege to do what I do. Um, when I'm not doing that, I enjoy the natural environment. I, I'm not just saying that because this is an interview about green finance, <laughs> but I do. And I think really? Kenya's got extraordinary riches. Yeah. And I enjoy that. And how do you unwind? I run. You're a marathoner. I'm not a marathon runner. <laughs> I do half marathons, I don't do full marathons. But I run a bit. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, I enjoy socializing with friends. So a decade, a decade at the helm of FSD Africa, uh, what do you want to achieve further than what you've achieved so far? Listen, we seem to have no end of opportunity at FSD Africa. Mm -hmm. we've, we've been through some uh, interesting times, um, re-strategizing um, and I think we're doing things that um, are relevant for the continent and are very important for our funders, which is the UK government. Mm. So we feel that there's going to be plenty of opportunity to grow this program and, and achieve a lot more impact. And I think we can do that for several years more to come. Ah, great. So a little history about how FSD Africa was formed as we finish. Well, I think the UK government has always been a big promoter of the idea of um, financial sector development. So, work, And I think the UK has a big finance sector, as we all know. And so I think, um, uh, and they have CDC, which is the development finance institution in the UK, which is an investment vehicle. Um, but I think they also understood the need to build regulation and to build capacity within uh, financial markets so that organize, any organization can can invest and, and create prosperity. And, and so they've been big backers of the idea of uh, financial sector development over the last 20 years, really. Um, and so um, with FSD Africa, they really felt that the opportunity had come for a large 
um, umbrella program across Africa that was able to build capacity in many countries all at the same time and really um, achieve scale in, in impact um, around financial sector development. So they decided to, to do that um, and, and that's really the history um, of where FSD Africa has come from. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, for that amazing uh, interview.